Hello everyone and welcome to Authors Revealed. I'm Natalie Vitali in for Becky Anderson and today we're with New York Times best-selling author Tim Gunn to talk about his new book, The Natty Professor. Thank you for making time to come sit and chat with me a little bit about your new book. Thank you Natalie for making time for me. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about this book and how it's different from your others. Well, I wanted to join in on what has become a national conversation about education. Everyone's talking about it and I wanted to put in my two cents worth. And I've had a lot of experience teaching and mentoring, 29 years in a classroom as a teacher. Um, I've also been a college administrator, so that's a, another layer of experience and of course I've been on Project Runway for 10 years, 13 seasons. So I have a lot to contribute. I don't want anyone to think that The Natty Professor is a preachy how-to book and then I'm going to tell you that you'll, if you read this you'll be a better teacher. I hope if you read it you'll have a little more of an enhanced lens on life writ large. I hope you'll laugh. Um, there may be a tear or two in a couple of places. Um, but I, I, I wanted to, to share my experiences because I value them and they were important to me. This book is most like my second book, which came out four years ago, Guns, Golden Rules, um, which was originally intended to be a, a modern manners for the digital age book and it turned into a, into a memoir. And I won't disguise the fact that The Natty Professor is very much a memoir and, and it's, it's very dear to me. I love in the book you have quotes from kind of everyday people talking about who inspired them as teachers or mentors along the way. Who are some of your mentors? Uh, well, I, as a child, my parents were certainly mentors and, and my maternal grandmother. Um, as an art student, well, and, and as, as a troubled adolescent, um, a, 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 a psychiatrist, frankly, a, a wonderful doctor by the name of Philip Goldblatt was certainly a mentor and continued to be after I, I stopped seeing him. And I only stopped seeing him because of geography and because he pronounced me, okay, you can leave. <laughs> um, as an art student, two wonderful teachers, Rona Slade and William Christenberry, to whom I dedicate the book. Um, and when I was at Parsons for those many, many years, the, the, the dean who was there when I first arrived, David Levy, was a mentor. And in the fashion world, I have to say it's Diane von Furstenberg. She's been a, a, a wonderful supporter and truth teller and, and pal. She's been great. So I'm very lucky to have had a lot of wonderful people around me. Nice. Anyone that has become an unexpected mentor in your life? Oh, well, I mean, in a manner of speaking, other than my parents, I think everyone. Mm -hmm. Because you, at least you hope that children look up to their parents and see them as role models. Um, and want to emulate them. Uh, after that point, I think it's it's really it's it's um, it's a crapshoot. <laughs> you just don't know, um, and you hope you fall under the the spell, so to speak, of of people with good values and um, a, a high level of, of of expectation and and quality. And you hope that those are the mentors. I mean, it can go the other way. It most definitely can, mm -hmm. and you can go down a r very rocky road and be given a lot of information that doesn't help you become a very good citizen of the world. And I, I have to say, I, I attribute so much of, uh, of, of who I am to my art and design education. Um, the notion that the answer isn't in the back of the book, it's within you, and, and, and how do you respond to that, and, and, and how, do you, um, how do you work with that? Mm -hmm. And to have faculty who are always insisting that only the best can be presented, so that you're always asking yourself, is this the best, is this the best, is this the best? And one could make a case for, oh, well that could uh, cause people to retreat and to withdraw and to say, I'm not even going to do this project, it won't be good enough. Mm -hmm. But the flip side of that is it can cause you to really feel that you need and want to ascend to please yourself, to please the faculty, and there's nothing greater than getting an A and deserving it. Um, and, and when it comes to creative areas, areas, there's nothing greater than having an epiphany about who you can be as demonstrated by the work that you're creating. 
Uh, you mentioned a lot your overhaul at Parsons, which is kind of proving your, um, like the best work is shown. And you were met with a lot of backlash during that time, and you mentioned it in the book. Yes. How did you know, like, and you decided yourself that you were doing the right thing for the program? I will tell you how. It was the students. For me, it was the students are truth tellers. And, I mean, you have to have a sieve of, um, a, a filter of sorts that allows you to know when someone's using the moment to their own advantage of sorts. But when you hear a consistent message, you know that there's something there. So for me, it was always the students um, and, and a few key faculty. But it was, in my head, it was always what's best for them, for the students. Mm -hmm. And that propelled me forward. Because if I'd only listened to the faculty, I don't think any change would have been made at all. And I have to say, I, I celebrate change. I love risk taking. I love the unknown. I, I admit I'm pretty rare. Most people don't like change. They're, they're terrified of it. They have this fear of the unknown. And for me, nothing's worse than inertia, than just, oh, the same, you know, Groundhog Day, day in and day out and day in. Can't we please move the needle forward? And if something bad happens, you can always retreat. You can always go back. So I, I, I love throwing the dice. And about that backlash... I needed the support of the senior administration at, at Parsons. I needed the dean's support at the very, at the, well, all I needed was the dean's support. And he gave it to me. I mean, I was called into a meeting of um, some very illustrious fashion designers in New York who wanted me gone, wanted me fired. This, this is bad for the school. It's bad for the graduates. It's bad for the industry. And the dean said to them, with me standing there, I didn't had no idea that they were in his office, but he called me in and, and he said to them, this is a this is an experiment. I um, trust Tim and his thoughtful judgment. We don't know where this is going to take us. We hope that it takes us to a higher place and to a better place. And if it doesn't, we can either go back to what we were doing before, which was never going to happen, <laughs> or we'll we'll try something else. It's an experiment, um, and that was a just a beautiful and very moving moment for me to know that I had to support that profoundly because these were powerful designers. Like you said, people and teachers and faculty often fall into a rut of this is how it's always been done. Yes. So how do you recommend they break that? Well, the first thing is when you find yourself saying that this is the way we've always done it, you know that isn't a good reason. In fact, that's one of the worst things anyone can ever say. Mm -hmm. Well, so what? Well, that's a reason to... to, to Disallow it to, to um, move on. I mean, it's, that's, a, that's a definite reason. Um, but then it does become a case of, well, but if we, don't, if we don't do what we've always done, then what do we do? Mm -hmm. Well, let's brainstorm. Let's talk about it. I, I mean, we were, when I was chair of the fashion program, Donna Karen was keenly interested in funding a, a master's program in fashion, and I was keen to have her do it. And she's a very important graduate of the school. She's been very involved in, in the department, and she's been a great supporter also. And the president of the university really wanted Donna's money to go elsewhere. And, and one of his um, rationales was the fact that this particular question was not suitably answered. And the question was, what will the students and graduates do? And my response and Donna's response was, we don't know. And that's what's so thrilling. Mm -hmm. We don't know. And he found that to be, he said, hideously irresponsible and n doesn't build any confidence in anyone. And that wasn't adequate, to which I, I said, not in front of Donna, but to, to the president, it's her money. <laughs> yeah, let her decide. It's her where money. It goes. Let her, and and I but, and I love that. We don't know where it's going to go. I mean, frankly, that's what I love so much about Project Runway. Mm -hmm. We lob a challenge out, and where where will the designers take it? We don't know until they take us there, and I I find that find that to be thrilling. Right, and seeing that final product is so exciting. I and to think that they did it in ten hours. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Unmanageable yeah. for someone like me, but. Well, I mean, I say the same thing. I'm in awe of them. Mm -hmm. Awe. 
Now, on the show, Project One Runway, excuse me, you're, um, you're known as the mentor. So yes. Was that something, did you always want to go into education and teaching and eventually? No. <laughs> what no. did you want to do originally? Well, originally, as, as a, uh, a kid and an adolescent, I wanted to be an architect. And I, I, I loved Lego. I, I couldn't get enough of them. I used all my allowance money to buy Legos, with one exception. My uh, parents took my sister and me to Monticello, Thomas Jefferson's home and outside of Charlotte, Charlottesville, Virginia. And I was nine years old, and I spent my allowance money on a book of Thomas Jefferson's architectural drawings. And my mother talked about it until she passed away, saying, how strange was this kid? Well, strange, I had a passion. And I studied architecture for one semester and hated it. Absolutely hated it. But it was in the olden days when you had to drop ink into a stylus and it was a recipe <laughs> for disaster. Um, and as a kid, I hated school. I, I mean, I loved learning, mm -hmm. but I hated the social aspects of school. I hated it. And I had fake illnesses and uh, was jumping off of roofs, anything to keep from having to go to school. Mm -hmm. S and I will say, when I finally went to art school, and it was after receiving a, a degree in literature, um, I loved the experience. I, I mean, I, I really, I flourished in the environment. I was happy in it. Um, it was a whole new threshold for me. And when I graduated, it was funny to have things come, come around. I, I had a degree in sculpture, and I had a studio where I was making work. But I couldn't support myself, mm -hmm. and I spent the three years after graduation building architectural models for firms in Washington, D.C. And the reason that that work stopped was because my mentor, Rona Slade, for, uh, who was the head of the fine arts department at, at the school, called and asked me to teach. And I thought, good heavens, me? I felt like the most unlikely candidate for that. And I will say it was not, a, it was not an easy fit. I spent the first week throwing up in the parking lot. I would shake so badly, I'd have to brace myself up, up against one of the walls in the studio. And I went to Rona at the end of that week thinking, once I confide in her how bad this experience is for me, she'll relieve me of my duties and she'll find somebody else. But rather than relieving me, she said to me, I trust that this will either kill you or cure you. <laughs> and I'm trusting that uh, on the latter, Good day. And I thought, oh, great. And eventually, it, my nervousness went away and all my anxiety attacks. And um, I it ended up being my career. Mm -hmm. So who'd have thunk it? <laughs> right. Yeah. And the mentorship on runway, I mean, I will say that was a difficult transition because teaching and mentoring are not the same. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't even meant to be. I mean, I, I was a consultant to the show. Um, my role was in no one's vocabulary. And... It was just days before the designers were arriving when the producers came to me and said, we think we need someone to go into the workroom and ask the, the designers questions about what they're doing. Well, it's what I did as a teacher for years. Mm -hmm. I, I ran a studio, a studio program. Um, so, I mean, who, who knew? And it was a remarkable, it's been a remarkable ride. Yeah, twists and turns and all I things. know. Yeah. Exciting. <laughs> it is exciting. I mean, I'm always saying you don't know where life's serendipitous path is going to take you. And you're a prime example of that. I, I, well, I am. I'm the poster child. Exactly. So um, you mentioned you were very nervous when you started teaching, oh. throwing up in parking lots, things like that. So what would you go back now and tell that um, fresh new teacher? Well, I do interact with that fresh, fresh new teacher a, 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 a good deal. And, and I say that, quite frankly... An innate fear can be channeled very positively. Mm -hmm. It can keep you um, alert on your toes. Um, it's much better than a complacence about, oh, well, this is a pizza cake, I can do right. this. Uh, but it does have to be worked through because you can't sustain it. That's mm -hmm. the trouble. You can't, you can't have a groundhog day of anxiety attacks. Um, so I just say, stay the course. A large part of my anxiety was self-fueled. It was mm -hmm. that I felt that I had to be the answer man. I had to have this encyclopedic knowledge that could be called upon like at my own internal Google. Um, I wish Google had been around then. <laughs> so I was constantly anticipating what my students might ask and I felt responsible for knowing the answer. 
And part of the epiphany that I had that allowed me to relax was realizing that that's ridiculous. And that's not at all what my role should be as a teacher. And it, it really should be about calling upon the students to be responsible for bringing this information back into the classroom and sharing it with all of us, as opposed to just a talking head at the front of the class to all these little birds in a nest. No, this is a big collaboration. And that was a huge relief. And it's something that I would say to my students at the beginning of every semester for 29 years, or what's 29 times two? It's too, it, I'm, I'm too weak to do the math right now. But that many semesters, mm -hmm. um, and they always looked, disarmed, as in, what do you mean we're responsible? You're the teacher. No, mm -hmm. this is a collaboration. And quite frankly, you all are doing 70% of the heavy lifting here. I'm, I'm, I'm in for about 30%, but you're doing 70% of it. And what would happen is the students would feel so heavily invested in the class that they felt responsible for its outcomes. So we always had a great time and great work. When did you kind of come up with the TEACH acronym you talk about in the book? It was in the course of searching myself for what are the qualities and attrib attributes that I believe are important in a teacher. Mm -hmm. And I love acronyms. So it, quite frankly, it was a bit of a stretch initially to think, okay, can I actually come up with words mm -hmm. that will use uh, T-E-A-C-H? And it wasn't that difficult. It wasn't that difficult. The, the most difficult one was H. Why is that? <laughs> I, I just kept thinking, what what can it be? Because you know, t truth telling is easy, mm -hmm. and empathy, and asking, and cheerleading, uh, because those th those are words that I use all the time anyway. But the H really eluded me, and I thought, hoping for the best. <laughs> At first, I just thought hope, and I thought, well, that sounds too loose ended. So, mm -hmm. but hoping for the best is really about um, let go. Just let, let go. Let, let, let the birds fly. Yeah, let's see yeah. what happens. Yeah, exactly. Let's talk a bit about the book itself and the writing process in general. Um, Why do you want to call the book The Natty Professor? Well, I wanted something that was a little tongue-in-cheek and that mm -hmm. would put a smile on people's faces. Um, I, I will be very candid with you. Gallery Books of, published it. Gallery mm -hmm. Books of Simon & Schuster wasn't crazy about it. They thought that it, it, it lowered the level of what the content was and that it would be potentially off-putting and people might think it was a comedy and I said well it is funny I mean there are aspects of it that certainly are but I said I don't I don't want to strike a pose that's that's overly serious mm -hmm. it's it, it's um, not who I am and I eventually broke them down they, they <laughs> love the title now but mm -hmm. but there was there was some resistance to be honest yeah, I, at first, when I was first reading the book, I didn't know what Natty meant. I was like, well, why would he call it that? And then I looked it up, and I was like, Good. how fitting. Good for how you. How fitting and witty. So I enjoy it. I'm glad but, you looked it up. You know, I have to tell you, when I when I wrote my first book, and it, it was not published by Gallery, um, the publisher came back to me and said, we need to excise all of these proper names that no one will know and all of these words that people won't know. And I said, I will not do it. <laughs> Let, let the reader sit with MerriamWebster.com <laughs> and Wikipedia or Google and figure out who these people are. I mm -hmm. want people to feel that their, their base of knowledge is, is enhanced, has You're grown. You're teaching them thank through you. the book. Right, <laughs> thank you. I get it. I'm delighted you looked it up, and now you know, and now you can share it with people. Yeah. Actually, this is kind of a side note, but a co-worker of mine would always call me Natty Nat. It was like to annoy me, and now I'm like, I'm going to tell him I take that as a compliment. Exactly. <laughs> you and I stand together. It is a compliment. <laughs> well, thank you. See, now I have Tim Gunn saying it's a yes, compliment. Yes, <laughs> it is. Most definitely. <laughs> thank you. So, obviously, this is not your first book. No. Um, what have you learned about yourself through this writing process? That I need Ada Calhoun, in all honesty. Mm -hmm. I do believe life, life is a collaboration, and for me, writing is. And my role with Ada is so beautifully defined by her. Um, I write, this is my assignment. I write 5,000 words a week. I turn them over to her. When we reach 15,000 words, so after three weeks, we meet weekly. And what she has done is she's taken those 15,000 words and she's shuffled them like a deck of cards and dealt them out. Mm -hmm. And, okay, so we have this content here and here and here and here. So she'll say to me, the next 5,000 words, I want you to fill out this and fill out that. Um, and we keep going. 
on week by week. And it's just the most wonderful relationship. Mm -hmm. And it's so gratifying and empowering and motivating to receive feedback and know where this is going mm -hmm. um, and, and, and to have a partner. So uh, for me, I, I do a lot of writing on my own, but they're, they're shorter projects, maybe 3,500 words or a thousand word or 1,200 word article. This is daunting. It's a lot of, it's a lot of stuff. And to have a partner who keeps you on point and who is so superb at critical analysis and, and who can objectify this, because for me, I'm resp I mean, they're, they're my words. I'm the one writing it, so I get very protective of certain things. There's so many stories in this that, aren't, that were in this that aren't there anymore, and there's so many stories that would have been so much longer were it not for Ada saying, look, we, we can't, this can't be a 700-word book. Um, and anyway, it's just, a, it's a fabulous relationship, and I won't write anything without her. I love how candid you are in your books. Um, in this book in particular, you kind of poke fun at Kanye West's $250, $100 t or not 100 $250 t-shirts, and the comments previously made by Anna Winter, and you're just throwing caution to the wind. So I love your honesty, but did that take a while for you to find, or was you're just like, this is the way I'm going to write it? Well, it began with Guns, Golden Rules. Mm -hmm. I just thought... Candor is important, and, and honesty and transparency is, an, is important. And, and, and I'm going to say, I, I don't believe in, in um, character assassinations. It's, right. it's not character that I'm going after. It has to do with, with actions, behavior. Um, I mean, in Kanye West's case, it's what you, just what you said, this expensive T-shirt. And I said the only thing dumber <laughs> than, than putting it out there is the person who buys it. Right. Um, and I will say, in the case of this book and Guns, Guns Golden Rules, the Simon & Schuster legal team sat with it very diligently and, and with, a, with an electron microscope saying, what could we potentially get in trouble for? Mm -hmm. So anything that couldn't be verified through research or um, some form of, of investigation, we took out anything. So if it's in there, it's true. <laughs> And I am always saying it's not it, it's not mean if it's true. <laughs> I mean, everyone is thinking it when I they know. hear about these things. I and know. So many in, people, and especially like in the higher ups of fashion, they support it completely. Or in front of the press, they support it. But it's so refreshing to see someone like you say, "No, that is ridiculous." I know. And people say to me, "Aren't you afraid you won't be invited to anything else?" <laughs> Don't invite me. <laughs> then I won't have stories to tell about you. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You'll be protected. I don't want to go. <laughs> so no, I, I really do believe in it. And, it. and I have to say, the fashion industry and the entertainment in industry, they're both filled with crazy people. Um, and I'm not going to pretend that they're not. And I don't want to drink the Kool-Aid. It's refreshing to hear that. Thank so you. thank you. Because I will say, I was a little nervous. I'm like, Tim Gunn's a fashion guy. Like, I'm going to be nervous. But oh, no. please. It's You're just so me. refreshing. Thank this you. No, no, we're pals. <laughs> Um, so first day of classes, first day of a new job, first impressions are made. Oh, how about at the job interview? Oh, job interview, but when you meet the rest of your co-workers yes. and everything. So what are some Tim Gunn ways to make a great first impression? Well, while I believe it's, so, it's very important that we be ourselves, we be, mm -hmm. be who we are, that first day, you need to be a bit of a shadow. I don't believe in, in coming on too strong being too overly assertive, learn what the culture's like, try to absorb how it is you believe you need to assimilate into that culture, and in which places or areas do you want to assimilate or not. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and that takes a while. I mean, I, in, in my experiences, it takes oh, several weeks to a month to really figure it all out. Um, and, and but just be be a fairly neutral player during that time. And I'm talking about more junior people coming into a company. If you're the mm -hmm. CEO, it's an entirely different matter, and they can all f assimilate what you're doing. Exactly. Um, but for more junior people, I, I, I just believe that that process of assimilation should be gradual mm -hmm. um, and thoughtful. And and also, this is a, more of a of, of a uh, life quality, but it's very appropriate in this early stages of work setting, and that is 
be a keen listener. Mm -hmm. Really listen to people. And anything that you're reading, be so, read it twice. Make certain you get it. And anything that you write, proofread it. Just do. Um, because with technology, all these things are happening around us. And I mean, I'm noticing now with autocorrect, it's, this isn't even remotely what I wrote. <laughs> Thank God I proofread it. Yeah, it'll change words up on you. you got to be careful. It will <laughs> indeed. And, and words that have nothing to do with what, I, what, I, what is actually being written. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> it can be dangerous. So anyway, listen, read, proofread. Very good. That's a very nice way to end. Thank you very much Thank again you. for making time for us. Best of luck at the signing. Thank you, Natalie. Very this excited. was lovely. And time's up already. This was so yeah. speedy. Yeah. I couldn't believe it either. I was wow. like, she's giving me the cue. Well, thank you. Congrats <laughs> thank to you. you. What a fantastic conversation with Tim Gunn about his new book, The Natty Professor. I'm Natalie Vitali, and thanks again for watching Authors Revealed.